Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Federico Talks Watches, or rather, Hanging with Hans. I totally How are you doing? Good. I'm good. How are you doing? Good, man. Actually, for anybody that sent in a repair to Delray watch, please excuse us. There's a there's a slight delay because you've been basically dying. I'm telling you, with that flu thing going on, it was really bad. I oh. was in bed for seven days, and today maybe you should move away a little bit. Like, I'm not yeah. so sure. Uh, the first time actually I started working was today. That's okay. why I have all my gear, my finger, and everything is on. You know, your, like, your finger that's, prophylactic. That's exactly what I need. So that watches don't get sick. <laughs> so the watch. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well, Hans, it's been a little while um, since we've had you on the show. For everybody that doesn't know, Hans here uh, does all the service for the watches at Delray Watch. If you guys need a watch repair, you should go to the website, delraywatch.com, and Hans, the master watchmaker. Mm -hmm ex-technical director of Asheron will take uh, very good care of you. But it Hans. Will be my pleasure. Right here, I got five questions. Four from the audience. Okay. One for me. All right. Um, that I'll leave till last. I hope we can answer those things. That maybe, um, you know, because watchmaking is so mystical, right? Like, it's, it's so complicated. Nobody knows. It is kind of a tricky business, you know, with all those tiny little parts and you hardly can see the parts. You need magnifying glasses, you need exactly. microscopes. So when we have someone like you that can actually answer these questions, sure. because people think I know watches. I actually, I, I'm just, I make, I make things up. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. We had long conversations and I'm not sure, for sure you don't make things up. <laughs> Um, but let's start, all right? Yeah. So, this is actually a really interesting one. Hans, in your opinion, what is the difference between Swiss watchmaking and German watchmaking? You being Austrian, which is neither Germany or Switzerland. Sure, so. sure. I mean, the, basically, it is the same. However, there is obviously a difference. Uh, the Swiss, in their design, I would think they're a little bit more softer versus the German style of watchmaking, when you look at some Lange uh, mm -hmm. uh, models, I have the feeling you can see a bit from the 1930s, 20s, from the Weimar Republic, the Bauhaus influence. Okay. I, I do think that, especially when you look at, at, at uh, the sharp edges of the, uh, the hands, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. things like that, it gives you that way. Obviously, all the pushings in the German uh, watches are screwed in. But the Swiss people don't do that. It well, all. German watches tend to be tougher, like three-quarter plates. It is interesting. It, that is the difference, yes. A service friendly in that sense. It is just uh, much more money to make the watch. Funny enough, in the end, when they actually sell those watches, they tend to be a bit cheaper than the Swiss watches. And Ooh, they, yeah. make, they put so much more labor in, in manufacturing it. Them. That's quite in interesting. So there is a difference in that sense. There's a difference. So the, the, the watches are very, there's no way to put it, they're very German. They're very German, yes. yes. They're very like, uh, Switzerland makes, for example, a good, a good uh, example is in, in the train, gear, in the gear train, uh, in, in high quality Swiss watches, every single gear has its own little bridge screwed on. The Germans, they put, uh, put a whole plate on top covering all the gears, but then they have the bushing screw there. Okay. And, and, and for each wheel, so it's quite interesting how they deal with different things. So Both of them are super beautiful. If you them. had to pick, controversial one, if you had to pick, what, and this is very generalized, right. but what do you prefer, German watchmaking or Swiss watchmaking? I was trained in Switzerland, so I can, I'm, I would say Deutschland. Deutschland? <laughs> Deutschland? <laughs> yes. Okay, fine. We're, and you were trained in Switzerland, and you yes. still say Deutschland. It's a, it's a little bit of a girly kind of watchmaking in Switzerland. <laughs> Jesus Christ. What can I say? I'm looking at John here, dude. We're getting so much shit for this video. All right, moving along. You just, okay. you just called every... What can I say? If anybody from Richemont's watching, Han just called you a girl. <laughs> um, well, except for you Lange guys. You're definitely men. Uh, whoop, I lost the questions. Here we go. Here, oh, dude, dude. Oh, there we go. Okay, here, here's another one. Oh. What made you become a watchmaker, man? Because if, who, who wakes up one morning and is like, you know what? I want to stress myself out with 400 parts. You know, that is a really awesome question. And especially when I went to watchmaking school, the, the chances that you actually had a profession was almost nil. I started in 1977. 
Okay. And I finished, graduated in 1981. And I at, that point, at that point, uh, the Quartz Watches was taking over the whole world. And there was just no outlook for any watch. People told me, do not start this profession, do not do it. However, my father, by, by, for his own right, he's a, a, a quite known sculptor. So oh, okay. he's in the arts himself. So for me, it was something which caught my attention to deal with the small parts, to modify and to produce parts, to actually manufacture parts, all those things we learned. So it was artistic. It was really a, a great choice. It happened that then there was the renaissance of watchmaking in the 1980s and 90s, where that all paid back. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to become a watchmaker in, in Europe, uh, it is the same amount of money you would pay uh, to become a lawyer for the watchmaking yeah. school. You have four years, four and a half years in that thing, and you, you have a huge education, you learn about all the materials and more and more and more. People have no idea how much goes in there. That's why I sometimes have to laugh when I see online classes about watchmaking for the for the hobbyists. Hey, I took a couple of those, okay. Come on now. We, we go to four and a half years of schooling, you think you can 12 weeks in a, with a guy who is far away from you. You can never do this. No, but that, that goes to show, okay, and I'm not just saying because I have the best, because I do have the best okay. in Mahalas. But Good there's right. two types, there's many types of watchmakers. And I've noticed this when I worked in retail, mm -hmm. when I worked at Richemont, you have one category of watchmaker who's not allowed to touch anything except an Edda. Yes. So like you touch 28, 24 all, right. all day. And then you, and there's like 20 of those. And then there's like the one guy or the two guys that do everything else. Right? It is true. Let me just quickly interject here. When I was, uh, after, after my schooling, I immediately went to Mexico and worked for Audemars Piguet in Mexico mm -hmm. City. Uh, Mr. Pluer, who ran the, ran the show there in Mexico City, he saw that I was hesitant to, to, to work on those high quality watches. And he said, Hans, the idea is all watches are equal. You just, once you know how to do it, and you know how to do it correct, there's no more difference between the high grade and the low Fair grade. Fair enough. But have you noticed? Because you've worked in all these companies. Mm -hmm. Not all, like, I mean, many watchmakers, once they put them on ETA duty, right. they don't ever upgrade them. They don't give it them more so education. True. They get stuck and doing it. Unfortunate. This is uh, what capitalism does to the, the industry because you, you kind of get cheap labor, which is, that was for me the. I love to work for Breitling. I came over, but did work for Breitling in one occasion. They were for long my customers, but then I actually worked for them and I hated it because I was only doing the, the most complicated, but only that. The busy one. No, this is just, just not what watchmaking is about. You do, like a, you do like the movement. You should have more. Yes, yeah, absolutely. All right. So okay. that's, that's unfortunate. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, I, I can, I, can say, I was going to say something a little bit crass. But okay. Look, if, if, if you're a chef, and you only make hamburgers. That's kind of yeah. wasting your talent. Call me fat hums? No. <laughs> <laughs> Moving along. Okay, here, here's one that I get asked all the time. And I know my answer. And I know most watchmakers' answers. But I've asked you. Tell me. Watch winders. Okay, people that put their watches on winders. You know, necessary or a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> I could actually answer this both ways. It is such a borderline case. You know, I personally think if you don't wear the watch and you just throw them away for 10 years, nothing's going to happen to the watch. Exactly. At all. For sure. Just put it in a drawer. We have synthetic oils in it that's not even, uh, you know, that, that will not decay, it will not get hard. It just sits there. So 10 years later, you take it on, it's going to be. If you have that watch for 10 years on a binder, it's a it will be off. It's pretty obvious, right? Yeah. So you so to summarize, it puts thing. unneeded stress. Yes. All my own production watches. I have uh, a whole line of watches I make for my own production. I never put on the winder. I just have it brand new, brand spanking new. Can and you believe? Mint. By the way, uh, like these crazy companies today, like Kubik or Bubin and Zerwin, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they charge you like eighteen hundred dollars for a winder. That's quite interesting. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's all makes sense because people want to, oh, I want to check over time if it keeps accurate time. I have a mechanical watch. Don't buy a quartz watch if you want that. If you have a mechanical watch, be aware that's that it another will thing. and lose time. I know a lot of people that they're like, oh, 
you know, my my Rolex is keeping one second a day. I'm like, well, it's absurd. Or, or people call me and they're like, Federico, I want a really accurate watch. It has to be 10 seconds a day. I'm like, buddy, get a quartz. Yes. Because you because it's mechanical watchmaking. Yes, it was for the pursuit of accuracy. Yeah. But nowadays, it's not. It's, it's, it's meaningless. Out. It's a, a piece of art. It is. A, I always compare mechanical watchmaking to digital watchmaking in a sense to digital imaging and a Picasso. A Picasso, you hardly recognize what that thing is, but the representation of real life in digital is it's, perfect. It's closer. Yes. But, what we do is a piece of a tiny miracle, a mechanical piece with 400 pieces moving constantly. A tiny miracle. See? Guys, Hans the philosopher, a tiny okay. miracle. All right. Oh, this is actually one of my favorite ones. And, and I'm surprised somebody asked this because people rarely talk about it. But you're the perfect person to answer this question. Okay. Hans, what is the difference between working for a big brand, like the technical director of Ashram? Yeah, yeah, yeah and running your own independent service center like a Delray watch or like you used to have in North Carolina. Right, right. For 17 years I did it uh, autonomously for myself, yes. The thing is, it just brings it back what we just said previously when I bring up that writing subject. Uh, to be a technical director in a company like that, you're only exposed to one brand. The beauty and the joy is if you're a chef to make all sorts of foods, to make all sorts of watch, to repair all sorts of watch brands. That's where you want to be. Like today, today I brought you a King Seiko with the most simple right. movement, and I brought you an Audemars Piguet chronograph. Exactly. And, the, and an Omega. And an Omega, and, the, and, the, and, and a Rolex. And, and the Girabago. And yeah. it's just awesome. Okay, so, so the main difference is the variety. Yeah, but absolutely. Also, but also, you were telling me something interesting, where I, I remember this conversation we had where they give you quotas mm -hmm. at the brands. Like you must fix four movements a day. Right. But uh, this is more, uh, I would think, in, in lower level, like Omni Mercier and, and, and yeah. lower level brands. Uh, the whole time I was uh, the technical director of Washington Constantine, we, we tried to do one or a half a watch a day. One or, or half? Yes, yes. Not one and a half. Okay. One or a half, a whole day. And sometimes that was not possible, so because you really take it serious and you take your time. And because Hans, you've also worked in retail, and you know we're not going to mention any names, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but some retail store owners they're not happy unless you finish five watches a day. Sure, but that, that's crappy workmanship you get in those places. Yeah. That's really what it is. It's, it's just not possible. You see, uh, but it's not possible. People still demand it. Correct. And then uh, you, as a watchmaker in a place like that, you have two choices: to uh, do it correctly or do I please my boss? Then if you please your boss, you don't take those movements apart any longer. You stick that whole thing in the cleaning machine, it's all ultrasonic. You take that whole thing out and you more or less You're oil done. it. Yeah. And, and that's not watchmaking. Yeah, it's watch butchering. I have to say that. That's exactly a great word. Did I, I, I used it all the time. Did I tell you the story of the watchmaker I saw in New York on 47th Street? I would love to. He was him. working on a Rolex while eating a turkey sandwich. Beautiful. Like mayonnaise on his hands. See, that's, that's my example with the chef and the watchmaker, you can actually combine those two. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. With one hand, you fix watches with a flip He was changing the Daytona dial with one hand and eating a turkey sandwich with the other. I would have loved this. The crumbs and shit. I was crying. <laughs> I'm like, ah, what's it. happening? I totally love it. And dude, it was awful. The, the <laughs> shit I've seen, dude, I, I'm not yes. even going to. Yes. I'm not even going to say it. All right. And here's my question. <laughs> And you guys don't know about this, but Hans, you're an interesting guy. You're not particularly religious, but you're spiritual, right? Hugely. Hugely spiritual. I'm right? a universe, I believe in all symbols. <laughs> okay. Well, here's what the question is. When, so I come in, you know, a couple, few times a week, yeah. and Hans is like, Federico, these are the watches that are ready. So I put them on the timing machine to check it out. And right before Hans puts it on the timing machine, every single watch, you bless, you bless the watch. And have you seen me done that sometimes? Yeah. And, and yeah. So, so where, when did you get magical powers? Look, it is extremely simple to understand that subject. Okay. In the 1970s, uh, the Max Planck Institute in okay. Germany. Don't they, know it? But okay. Yeah, it's, it's one of the think tanks, the biggest think tanks in Europe. They actually made uh, measurements of people who had injuries and people sending uh, positive vibes to them, they healed about 40% faster than the people without. 
Did they hand a closed so wall? You there was an experiment. You can actually YouTube, Google it, and you follow that. That totally exists. So your positive vibes. That's exactly right. It comes from the Max Planck Institute. And please, did you see the result change on my yeah, watches? Okay, so guys, not only are you getting a master watchmaker, but you're also getting 40% better timekeeping <laughs> with Hans's patented Good magic, <laughs> magic box. Dude, I'm not even shitting you. He'll put a watch in the timing machine, and he'll literally he'll I do always this. do that. He blesses it. I always do that. And, and believe it or not, like 40 percent of the time, it actually works. <laughs> I know, dude. You're such a freak, man. <laughs> I actually have one question for you too, if I can. Oh, of course. Can we, in the future, the next time, also have your business partner in the video? That would be fun. Maybe we. Yeah, sure. Well, John's just sitting over there, laugh, laughing his ass off. <laughs> that would be really cool. Because we, I actually so, assume we should do something. Here, here's the thing, <laughs> when me and you talk about on a video, yeah. we talk about watches. If I put you two jokers together, <laughs> there's only one subject you're going to talk about. And guys, it's not watches. Okay? So let's, let's Okay, know. let's do this then, not. Yeah, we got let's some. Not to do keep this. Keep it PG. Okay, right? okay, that's a deal. Dude, you're, was, you're married and you're... Whatever, guys, we're ending the video right here before I get in any more trouble. Check out Delray Watch, uh, delraywatch.com for some cool pre-owned watches. And of course, if you need Hansi it's to repair pleasure. your watch. I would love to do that. Thank you for supporting us. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys, and we'll catch you in the next one. Super. Take care.